Hello and welcome to the final lesson in our Reaction Kinetics Unit. In today's lesson entitled Homogeneous and Heterogeneous Catalysts on Reaction Rates, we have the lesson objective of describing how catalysts increase the rate of reaction and illustrate this on a Boltzmann distribution and to understand the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts. The learning outcomes we're addressing as always just below there. So the idea of catalysts and catalysis is something that we've mentioned in passing uh, a fair few times throughout our video series. So today we're really going to look in depth at how a catalyst will speed up a reaction by lowering the activation energy of the reaction. So that's what they're doing. They're increasing the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy. The catalysts aren't consumed at any point in the reaction. So at the start of the reaction, you have the same uh, chemical species for the catalyst than you do at the end of the reaction. So this means they are reusable in theory. Therefore, it's not a reactant and you usually write it above the reaction arrow. So if we have a reaction, let's say we have some sort of reactants forming some sort of products. When you're representing the catalysts, you usually write it above the reaction arrow. So it's showing that it's not being used up. It's still involved in the reaction process, but it's separate from the reactants. It has no effect on the position of equilibrium. Thinking back to our equilibrium unit, um, it won't change the position of equilibrium to the left or the right at all. However, it will just increase the rate of the reaction so the equilibrium will be re reached sooner than if a catalyst wasn't there, but it's not going to affect the position of the equilibrium at all. And we can show this on an enthalpy profile diagram. So let's draw an enthalpy profile diagram as we have been doing a fair few times so far in this unit. So on our y-axis, as always, we have the energy, and on the x-axis, we have the reaction pathway, just as the reaction takes place. So let's say if we were to have an exothermic reaction, we would have reactants. They require some sort of activation energy to react, and we end up with our products. So we have reactants here, and we have products there. Now, we know the energy needed to cause this reaction to occur can be shown here. That is the activation energy for this particular reaction. And the delta H can be gotten by getting the energy difference between the reaction, reactants and the products. That is our delta H. We have a negative delta H here, so we're going to end up with a exothermic reaction giving off heat. Now, what the catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy needed for this reaction to occur. So this is the activation energy without a catalyst. So if we have a catalyst, it stays the same. Our delta H doesn't change. What changes is just the energy needed for the reaction to occur, for the activation energy, the energy to be activated. So in that case, we'll have our red here. This would be the activation energy with catalyst. Yeah, to show that on a Nita diagram, we would have an exothermic reaction here. We've got a certain amount of reactants forming products. We have an exothermic reaction where we have an activation energy here. So we've got a very high activation energy when we don't have a catalyst, but with the addition of a catalyst, that activation energy decreases down to there. So in this case, the dotted line was the previous activation energy. With a catalyst, we reduce the activation energy and the reaction can occur a lot quicker. So how does a catalyst work. The good news is that we don't really need to know the specifics of how a catalyst operates at this point, but it's worth just considering because it helps us sort of understand them a lot better. So what they do is they give an alternate uh, mechanism in order for the particles to react. And you can see that on the diagram, instead of operating and uh, reacting via this mechanism, they react via that mechanism. And they can do this a few different ways. They can orient the reactants in a way to increase the likelihood of successful collisions. So we've talked about reactants needing to have 
uh, enough energy to react. If you have, say, maybe a long organic molecule and you've got the reactive area on one side away from the other side, then they've got to collide with the reactive part next to each other, yeah? So, I mean, the, what am I trying to say? The catalyst can help to orient them so that the parts of the molecules or the parts of the species that are reacting are in a position to make that happen a lot easier. They can also form different sort of intermediates that have lower energy. If they have lower energy, they can be more stable. And in fact, they can cause uh, a number of intermediates to be formed. You could even have a catalyst where you would have, let's do an endothermic reaction this time, where we would have our reactants forming products like that. The catalyst might, actually I might make this a bit more drastic so I can illustrate my point a little bit clearer. Let's say that down there. The catalyst might do something like forming an intermediate and then another intermediate and then another intermediate. So you've got sort of different transition states that occur. But essentially all it's doing is just changing, providing an alternate mechanism in order for the reaction to occur. Let's relate this to the Boltzmann that we looked at in the previous episode. To recap what the Boltzmann is, the Boltzmann distribution is a graph illustrating the distribution of energies that particles in a system have at any given temperature and it has this kind of shape. For a recap on this, go see the previous video in this series. We said that particles with an energy greater than an activation energy are able to have a successful collision. So if I got all my particles represented by the area under the curve, so much energy needed for this reaction to occur, the particles that have energy greater than that, as seen by the area to the right hand side of the activation energy, they are able to have successful collisions. Now our catalysts increase the rate of reaction but they don't affect the shape of the Boltzmann distribution as opposed to looking at how temperature increased the rate of reaction and we saw how the Boltzmann distribution would shift uh, and change the shape of it depending on if you're increasing or decreasing the temperature. In the case of the catalyst, the Boltzmann distribution stays the exact same shape. What happens is sort of similar to what we see on the enthalpy profile diagram is we reduce the activation energy. So if we have an energy and activation energy here, the catalyst isn't changing the energy of the particles at all. So all the particles are going to have the exact same distribution. What's gonna happen is this activation energy is going to be decreased. So this is the activation energy without a catalyst. A catalyst will lower the activation energy. So therefore a greater proportion of the particles within the Boltzmann distribution will have energy greater than activation energy. So if I add a catalyst, I have a new activation energy with uh, the catalyst here. And as we can see, a larger proportion of the particles are going to be able to have successful collisions. So if I draw a Boltzmann distribution, just to reiterate the point, we have the number of particles on the y-axis, we have the energy on the x-axis, and then number of particles, so if I have my Boltzmann that looks something like that, let's say, oh, not bad if I say so myself. If we had a activation energy without a catalyst, saying that there, so that's my activation with no catalyst, we would only have this proportion of particles having energy greater than that, so only that proportion would be able to react. If I add a catalyst, I lower the activation energy, so the new activation energy is lower on the x-axis. So let's say my catalyst has new activation energy of there, so this is activation with a catalyst. And you can see that in this instance, a much larger proportion of the particles are now gonna have energy greater than the activation energy when compared to having no catalyst present. So our catalyst has no effect on the shape of the distribution. It just moves the activation energy down. So we now have more particles, a greater proportion with energy greater than activation energy. From here, we need to introduce two new terms. We need to look at the idea of a homogeneous catalyst and a heterogeneous catalyst. As with all words that we sort of see in chemistry, they kind of sound more intimidating than they actually are. And it's really useful with all these words to sort of break them down into different sections and that helps us understand what they might mean. So let's do that in this 
instance here, let's consider the prefix, the prefix and the suffix of homogeneous and heterogeneous. If we look at the prefixes, so that means the first part of the word, we have homo and hetero that we use for a number of different words, yeah? And it essentially comes from ancient Greek where homo means the same, hetero means other. So in this case, homogeneous has something to do with something the same, heterogeneous has something to do with two things that are different. If we look at the suffix genius, when I was sort of researching what genius really means, it kind of, kind of means arising or resulting from, produced by or generating. So if we think of the idea of a homogeneous catalyst, um, the homogeneous catalyst has something rising with the same thing or resulting from the same thing, whereas the heterogeneous is from different things. And what it's referring to here is the phase of the reactants and the phase of the catalyst. So if we have a homogeneous catalyst, it means that the phase is arising from the same, so it's the same phase essentially. If we have a heterogeneous catalyst, the phases are different. Right, so here's a good definition. Putting them together, homogeneous catalyst is a catalysis where the reactants and the catalyst are in the same phase, so homo uh, from the ancient Greek for same, Heterogeneous catalyst is a catalyst where the reactants and the catalyst are in a different phase. So hetero meaning other. Question, I got three reactions here. For the following reactions, identify which have a homogeneous catalyst. So the catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants, as the reactants and which one has a heterogeneous catalyst, as in they're different. Pause now. I mean, it's pretty simple. There's no tricks here. You've just got to think. Is it the same or is it different? <laughs> Pause now, see if you can have an answer and then check it when you resume. So let's look at this first one. We have a catalyst that is in the gaseous phase. We have two reactants that are both in the gaseous phase. They're the same. They're arising in the same thing. So it's going to be a homogeneous catalyst. Number two, we have a solid state catalyst and we have an aqueous reactant that is going to be heterogeneous. They are in different phases to each other. And down the bottom there, we have a solid catalyst with two gaseous catalysts. They're in different phases. It's going to be a heterogeneous catalyst. So I think pretty straightforward for these terms, homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. It's just referring to if they're in the same phase or not. And to finish up this unit, we're going to just briefly discuss the concept of an enzyme. Um, enzymes are catalysts that are found in biological systems. So within biological systems, there's all sorts of chemical reactions that are constantly occurring to create a biological being such as yourself. Um, so enzymes are just catalysts that are facilitating these biochemical reactions to speed them up. Now they're quite interesting because they have a number of uh, unique properties that is different to an inorganic catalyst. So when we're talking about inorganic catalysts, we're just talking about you know, reactions that we're doing outside of a biological system, pretty much. So most are homogeneous catalysts. They're occurring in the aqueous phase. They are very specific and they are very efficient. So they're pretty much, a specific enzyme is pretty much only there for one specific type of reaction. And because they're so specific, they are very, very efficient. The, the enzymes cause the reaction to occur very, very quickly. And also because they're very efficient, they don't often have byproducts. Yeah, so we just have these enzymes that are good at their job, <laughs> essentially. Um, now, because they are operating in biological systems, they do so under mild conditions. If you think about your own biological system, you've got a relatively low temperature, you've got a relatively neutral pH, and you've got a relatively low pressure. So they're not good when you take them outside of those conditions. And in fact, they can denature if the conditions get too harsh. So if you think about rate of reactions, you might think that, well, temperature, if we increase the temperature really, really quickly, we're gonna get an even faster rate of reaction. However, these enzymes are, uh, have been evolved, I suppose would be the right word there, um, for biological systems. So if you increase the temperature too much, they sort of denature, they fall apart, they break apart, or the shape changes and they don't do their job anymore. So they do have optimal temperatures and optimal pHs that they work at. 
All right, so the specific molecule that fits on the surface of the enzyme is called a substrate. Substrate, you could have one substrate that is decomposing into multiple products, or you could have multiple substrates that are synthesizing a new product. We just refer to the molecule, the reactant in this biological system as a substrate. And what happens is we create an enzyme substrate complex that forms before converting substrates into the product. So this is just essentially a transition state between the catalyst, the enzyme, and the reactants, the, uh, the molecules, the reactants, yeah. And there's this uh, analogy, this model we can use, which is called this lock and key model that helps to illustrate it. And we can also look at this on an enthalpy profile diagram. So if we think about what lock and key means, if you've got a lock and key, you've got a lock on a door and there's only one specific key that can unlock that door. So we can see that here. In this case, we've got one substrate, one uh, reactant that wants to turn into products, right? Now, if we draw this on an enthalpy profile diagram, so we draw our enthalpy profile diagram, y-axis there, and the x-axis there. So energy and reaction pathway. So essentially, let's just say this is an exothermic reaction where we have our reactants forming to our products and we have so much activation energy that we need to overcome or we need to supply for the uncatalyzed reaction. What the enzyme does is it lowers the activation energy by allowing the substrate, the reactants, to bind to the surface of the, com uh, of the enzyme to create an enzyme substrate complex. This orients it in the correct position to allow it to undergo the reaction easier and we form our product. So in this case, we've got one substrate forming two products, but we could you know, potentially even have two products going and forming a new product the other way if that was the biological reaction that was occurring. So if we think of this in terms of the energy profile diagram, what the enzyme is doing is it is reducing the activation energy like we saw on that first slide like that. And it's doing this by having the enzyme and the substrate separate like that. So this is when we're at the first step here. So we've got the substrate and we've got the enzyme and it binds at the active site which is where all the magic happens. Then we form the enzyme substrate complex. So the enzyme bonds to the substrate and this allows the reaction to occur at a lower energy because it's offering an alternate mechanism for the reaction to occur. So that is this point or these points in the center here where we've got the enzyme bonded to the substrate to form the complex the reaction occurs and then we've got an enzyme product complex and then what we end up with at the end is the enzyme remaining the same and we've now got our products being formed. So that's why the enzyme is acting as a catalyst here because the enzyme is the same as it was afterwards. It hasn't been consumed in the reaction. Right, so that's a biological application of the catalysts. And with that, we have finished the units on reaction kinetics. What have we done? We've explained and used the term catalysis, explained that catalysts can be homogeneous or heterogeneous, explained that in the presence of a catalyst, a reaction has a different mechanism, interpret this catalytic effect in terms of the Boltzmann distribution, and described enzymes as biological catalysts, uh, also called proteins, which may have specificity. And with that, we have not only concluded our unit on reaction kinetics, but also this series in physical chemistry. Thanks for your time and good luck.